Yes. So yes, as Andrew says, I'm going to talk about from corporate science to responsible science and, and the role of R&D. So um, I'll jump straight in. Thank, thanks to you all for coming, by the way. Um, it's great to see such a, a good audience and, and so many good presentations that I've got to follow. Um, so yes, if I can just get my slides to move. Come on. Right. OK, so obviously science and technology have a huge potential to help us tackle major problems in society, um, everything from poverty, war, climate change um, in different ways. But often the powerful political and economic interests encourage a focus on techno fixes and narrow interpretations of economic growth, GDP growth. And then we've heard some of that um, in the previous presentations, rather than a broader focus on research and development driven by a broader agenda of, of peace, preventing war, social justice, environmental sustainability, and, and a broader approach to solutions, which is not just technology, but is social and economic reforms as well. And uh, again, some of the things that we've been, been talking about in the previous presentations. So could the structure of the science and technology sector be part of the problem? And that's what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to focus on two concepts here, that the false solution of corporate science and my proposed solution of responsible science. And, and some have turned it um, science for the public good. Um, and um, yeah, the um, that, 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 that sort of um, area. So. Here, I, I've got a table which, sorry, that jumped there. Um, so here, here I've got a table which compares some of the attributes of, of the two different types of, of, of structure of science. So for example, in a corporate science world for funding sources of R&D, you've got the business, the private sector dominant, whereas in responsible science framework, you've got a, a much more equal role with the public sector and civil society. For innovation um, in the corporate science realm, you've got a narrow focus on technologies and, and particularly using patents, whereas in the responsible science um, realm, you've got a much broader focus, which brings in social and economic reform. Um, but in the role of universities, um, universities are, are generally said to have three missions. So education, research, and a third mission of um, public benefit. And that third mission is often narrowly focused in a corporate science framework to, to just be a focus on economic growth or GDP growth and universities operating more and more as corporations. Where as in a responsible science framework, you've got um, a much broader third mission, which has all, all these wider, uh, tackling these wider problems as, as um, part of the, uh, the fundamental work that they do. And, and so that takes you to um, the role of social health, environmental concerns in a corporate science framework. These are lower priority and in a responsible framework, they're, they're a much higher priority and, and guidance and, and indicators such as the sustainable development goals and planetary boundaries are what are, are guiding and steering um, um, scientific research and research and development. And then um, the three further criteria. So in openness, um, in terms of openness, you've got corporate science, which is, puts a low priority on, on openness. You've got commercial, commercial convent, convent <laughs> confidentiality, I get my words out. Um, and national security restrictions, you've got publication via commercial journals, but in a responsible science framework, you've got high priority on, on openness. And so you've got declarations of interest by authors, so you know where their funding comes from, where they work. You've got open access publishing, so, so um, free to access journals, for example. Um, this, the role of scientific skepticism in a corporate science framework. Um, is used by industry to, to challenge um, evidence of, of social health and environmental harms. Whereas in a responsible science framework, it's used by public sector civil society to, to support concepts like the precautionary principle and the polluter praise, pays principle. And then the role of academic disciplines. Um, in a corporate science framework, you've got a priority and, and um, a, a particular focus on, in funding on, on areas which can lead to um, areas that you can make money. So, so physics, um, engineering, economics, whereas 
in a responsible science framework, you've got a, a more equal um, situation between the dis different disciplines and you've got a, a higher priority for things like social sciences, environmental sciences, philosophies, and, and particularly interdisciplinary research. Um, so how far is, is the UK down the corporate science path? Well, it, the simple answer is quite a long way. Um, but to give you a bit more detail, um, let's start with who funds research and development in the, in the UK. So these are the latest um, figures from the Office for National Statistics. And you can see business is, is by far and away the biggest funder. 59%, um, that's just UK business. Once you include overseas business, then it rises to about two thirds of the income. So you can see how dominant it is there. Um, and there are a number of disturbing trends in UK science and technology. Um, on, on UK universities, they're increasingly pushed towards um, prioritizing GDP growth. Um, instrumental in this was the 2013 Witty Review, which argued that the third mission should be narrowly focused on, on growth. Um, and this was influential in the um, government's um, 2017 Higher Education and Research Act, um, which included greater marketization into the system of, of research and, and universities um, and, and um, has had um, many problems um, because of that. And then in a post-Brexit post world, you've got various deregulation happening. Um, some Brexiteers were particularly motivated by deregulation of science and technology. Um, Dominic Cummings, chief advisor to Boris Johnson, um, was one of them. Um, and he was he had the brainchild of the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, which has been formally set up this year. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but you've also seen other um, other aspects of, of this deregulation in things like the precautionary principle and the pollute pays principle is being steadily downgraded in UK law with some um, um, weaker wording in, employed in the laws that come into effect in December 23 and at the end of this year. Um, you've also got major rises in military R&D spending, which benefits the arms corporations. Um, and this has been funded in the UK by cuts to foreign aid research and development. So cuts in, in poverty, work for poverty, um, and being um, immediately cut for, for um, spending on arms. And also cuts to the research budget has been directed to increase the, the funding. And it's of the order of about £800 million per year um, that, that has been shifted um, between these budgets. Um, you've got the link between fossil fuel industry and universities and professional bodies, which is, is disturbing. And, and even to the extent that you've got, got government ministers um, promoting conspiracy theories around woke science and 15-minute um, cities um, and some of the things that came out of the Conservative Party conference um, just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'll say a bit more about the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, ARIA. Um, which is, has just been formulated. This is a new public research agency, um, but it's focused on transformational technological change and economic growth for generations to come. But key, key within it is it operates independently of our other government departments, including the new Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. Um, so it, it, it's its own own organization it's exempt from the freedom of information act and it has a very large budget so the operational um it, it's argued that oh they, this frees it from party political intervention but it also frees it from um accountability and and um responsibility i, I argue and and particularly because it's the model that was used for this agency is, is darpa the um military research agency in, in the US. Um, all the warning bells are, are, are sounding quite quite loudly on this. Um, I mean, arguably, because it, it um, has a remit that includes health, environment, it, it could tackle things like the degrowth argument. Um, but I don't have much hope at the moment that that's what it's actually going to look into. It'll be about AI and, and, um, and other transformative technology. Um, and this is indicated by the UK Science and Technology Framework, which the Sunak government brought out earlier this year. Five critical technologies for strategic advantage. Um, you don't see much in there about climate change. 
Um, the emphasis again is on economic growth, pro-innovation regulation system, um, which yes, less regulation in many cases. Um, we do have a brief mention of, of health and sustainable environment leveling up, but um, at the moment that they seem to be um, pretty lip service and no mention crucially of concrete um, issues like contributing to the sustainable development goals or climate change in, in a, a broader sense. There's also been the, the international technology strategy, which has come out um, a, a few months after this. It's a bit broader in focus, a bit more acknowledgement of the global issues, but, um, but still falls very far short. So challenging these negative trends on, on the positive side, there have been um, campaigns that have sort of successfully blunted some of these these corporate science proposals um, in the mid 2010s. Um, those of you with good memories will remember that the, the SGLs conference in 2016 focused on some of these issues and fe featured speakers from the campaign from public university, for example, and, and they did some campaigning around Found the Higher Education and Research Act and, and were able to blunt some of the, the worst um, elements of it. Um, there are also some progress being made by science bodies reducing their links to fossil fuel industries and People and Planet have done some very good work on this with UK universities. There's a new group, group called Fossil Free Research, which is international, which is pushing on this. SGR has done some really good work on, on um, professional bodies, um, academic publishers was done to make some change in those areas. We've seen some progress with academic publications, um, stricter um, um, declarations on conflicts of interest led by the medical journals, more open source publishing, so more access um, without paying to, to journal articles. Um, and at least some of the wording in national science strategies um, has been to support the importance of, of health, social inclusion, environmental protection. And I, I have to say, I'm a bit more hopeful that, that there will be a new government who will take these things a bit more seriously, or hopefully a lot more seriously. Um, but these sorts of things can be exploited by individual scientists, campaigners in, in sort of being hooks, which which we can use to push for, for much stronger um, um, uh, um, measures and research programs around tackling some of the, or at least contributing to tackling some of the problems like um, biodiversity loss or, or poverty or inequality or, or, or everything else. Um, but but a question that we that I'll finish on is: Do we need an office for scientific responsibility? And and briefly, this was an idea that Andrew Sims and, and Phil Weber came up with, um, and there's a blog about it on SGL website. Um, around something akin to the Office for Budget Responsibility that's used for judging economic competence in gov government and, and stopping um, ministers getting away with um, misleading um, analysis or misleading statements. And um, so trying to do that more in a scientific realm, pulling them up when they say, oh, this will tackle climate change, well, actually it won't. Um, and... and um, and, uh, and trying to get a bit more rigor in decision making, a uh, more evidence based. There's, this might be a way in which we can we can challenge these things. So I shall leave it there. And I'll put this on the SGL website, a bunch of references as well. Thank you, Stuart. You've completed our our our, our round, our, our quartet of cause to force, if if one can say that. <laughs>